Well, this morning I wanted to share with you about a preemptive strike. You know, that's a, that an attack that stops or eliminates a threat before it can be implemented. And I imagine there's some that remember the Cold War when the United States and the USSR, they began building nuclear arsenals and they had tens of thousands of intercontinental ballistic missiles, enough for a preemptive strike that would completely obliterate the other side. And then they had fleets of nuclear submarines to ensure that the destruction would be mutual. What a crazy world we live in, huh? You remember crawling under your desk for the air raids? Like that's going to save you from a nuclear attack. Do you know that the Bible records there's preemptive strikes? It shows some. That remember when King Saul and David were returning from the battle against the Philistines and they sang, Saul's killed his thousands and David's killed his ten thousands. And that didn't set very well with King Saul. And, and in Chapter 18, verse 11, it says, And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Preemptive strike. At, at Christmas time, we often read about Herod and how the wise men came to him and said, Where is he that's to be born king of the Jews? And as soon as they left, it tells us that Herod's response was, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts. <coughs> Preemptive strike. We, we read about Saul from Tarsus and the Pharisee and his response to believers, to Christianity. It's found in Acts 9, the first couple of verses. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You know, these preemptive strikes were irrational. They really were, because David was a loyal and a faithful servant to Saul. And Herod, slaughtering many innocents, just on a chance that he might get the right one. And, and this was an infant that, even if he was to reign, wouldn't be old enough to do it until Herod was already died of old age. Saul of Tarsus was pursuing harmless men and women to another country, as if they were a threat to the Jews in Jerusalem. All this was, was irrational. But I want us to look into what Jesus taught his followers on the night he was betrayed after the Last Supper, and it's found in John chapter 15. So I want us to look at John 15. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. This happened, that the word might be fulfilled which is written in the law, they hated me without a cause." Jesus says, the world is going to hate us. He also says that it's irrational. They hated him without a cause. You know, 
<clears throat> in biblical times, and even now in much of the world, believers don't have any rights. Not like we would have here in the United States. And here in the United States, our, our military protects our nation from threats <coughs> outside our borders. <coughs> And they constantly monitor all these threats, and sometimes, occasionally, they make preemptive strikes that they deem necessary. And there are many that, with good reason, believe that our nation's freedoms and rights, as defined by the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, that these are being threatened by those within our borders, that there's things like long-standing laws being suppressed, constitutional freedoms being infringed upon, tyrannical demands being made, widespread corruption being ignored. Now, you probably notice that discussions about such things tend to be controversial. The truth is, many things can be controversial. And as the discussions go on, sometimes they can get irrational. And have you noticed that these controversial things, when they're things that affect our everyday life, the way we live, all of a sudden people begin to feel threatened when it's subjects like that. And when people feel something they care about being threatened, the volatility rises, the irrationability rises, and words and attitudes can get to preemptive strike levels real fast. We've probably all seen this, and probably most of us, if we were sincere and truthful, would have to raise our hand that we've been there, done that. And, and I suppose that I don't need to remind us that Jesus taught us that we are not to be making preemptive strikes. Remember Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44? You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now Jesus wasn't teaching a theory, something theoretical, and he wasn't teaching something that's an impossible response. He's teaching something that takes a deliberate, willful choice. It takes a deliberate and willful choice. And remember Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee, the one making preemptive strikes on believers? Well, he met the risen Christ on that road to Damascus. And he became Paul the Apostle. And as such, he has some relevant instruction for us about how to approach these controversial subjects and responses that are necessary to receive beneficial results. In other words, when we have these controversial things going on, we aren't going to get beneficial results just because. There's instruction for us, and it's found in 2 Timothy. So I want us to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I want us to take note of what the Apostle Paul has this to say. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife. Now there's a big clue right there. Don't go down that road. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. I want us to see that there's three things here that, that 
we need to take note of their necessities that we be patient, gentle, and humble. Because these are character qualities that we personally need as followers of Christ. They're essential. And, and to help us see the relevance for us as believers that we maintain, have and maintain these character qualities, besides just for in the need of dealing with those that are controversial and in opposition against us, but that we personally need these things in our life, I, I want us to look at what James has to say in his letter about these things. And so I want us to, to look at each one of these, patience, gentleness, hum, humility, in light of what James says about them. In James 1, verse 4, he says, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do you know that you won't mature in Christ if you don't have patience? You can't grow up without patience. Have you ever noticed infants? Their patient level is what? Zero. Anyone who has little kids knows this. To grow up, you need patience. As we continue to look at this, when we look at James chapter 3 and we look at verses 17 and 18, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Gentleness is a part of godly wisdom. It's also a fruit of the Spirit. Have you ever noticed that when gentleness is absent, we're probably operating from the flesh? It's obvious probably more to people around us than it is to ourselves. But when gentleness is absent, you are not walking and operating in the wisdom of God, but more in the flesh and your own old nature. And when it comes to humility, well, James chapter 4, verse 6 says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Is there anyone that thinks they're going to get very far without God's grace? If I read that right, it takes humility. If you want more of it, if you want more of God's grace, it takes humility. So we need this patience, gentleness, and humility. And what did I want us to go back and put it in context with what Paul said? What did Paul say was a possibility if this is our response to those who oppose us? Maybe these who are being irrational. What, what's a possibility if we respond with patience, gentleness, and humility instead of a preemptive strike? Didn't Paul say they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil? Wow. Remember, Paul was an opponent. He opposed the church. He was a very real threat to the church. But something happened, and I want us to take note of what Paul said happened in him and what he has to say about it. It's found in Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 through 17. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, 
immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Did you notice that Paul said he was a pattern? He was an example. Now, for anyone that, that's a builder of anything, when you make a pattern, it's because you're not just going to make one. You're going to make many. So Paul is saying this sort of thing, because he's a pattern, he's an example. He says this sort of thing should be happening again and again and again. That those who are in opposition will receive abundant grace and mercy. Now remember the necessities that we need when we face those who are in opposition. Patience and gentleness and humility. I want us to, to listen what the Apostle Peter said in his old age. It's found in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is patient. It's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, he could bring a preemptive strike upon anyone on this planet at any time and be entirely just in doing it. But he doesn't. He's patient. He's long-suffering. So we have to ask ourselves, how are our words and attitudes and actions? Are we always ready for the preemptive strike? We've got those 10,000 nukes and they're armed. Or are we gentle, patient, humble? You know, communion is a time for us to reflect on the fact that God didn't preemptively strike us. Quite the opposite. He loved us and he gave his son, Jesus, to make atonement for us. Communion is a time to reflect upon the suffering and the death that made atonement for our sins. It's also a time for us to examine our life. Is our life response appropriate in light of what's been done for us? We have to ask... Are we showing patience, gentleness, and humility?